Hello from Oscar Zero. My name is Rob. I'm the site supervisor up here. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Cold War today. Now, something that's bothered me ever since middle school and high school. You would talk about world history. You talk about American history. You get all the way into the 20th century. And then, boom, it was the middle of May. Um, things had to be kind of rushed forward. So you talk a little bit about World War II. But they never seemed to get to the point of the Cold War. And that was my favorite subject. So we're going to end that today. We're going to talk about the Cold War. And hopefully uh, this will reach uh, some kids, not in the classrooms right now, um, but maybe at home and maybe classrooms later. So let's get started. World War II. Okay, you have to look a little bit back into history to see where the Cold War really came from. Uh, September 1939, Nazi Germany was a strong military power. They invaded Poland. The Soviet Union invades from the east. And they kind of carve up Poland at that point in time. So uh, the Soviet Union is, uh, was, excuse me, a communist state since 19, uh, 1920s when the Civil War basically ended over in Russia. Um, you know, there was the Russian Revolution in 1917. But uh, Nazi Germany uh, basically came into power in the 1930s during the Great Depression. They were very strange allies at the outbreak of World War II. Um, England and France declare war on Germany. Uh, France doesn't have a good time of it. By June 1940, they had to surrender because uh, Germans forces basically came into Western Europe. England was on their own. The United States at that point in time was an isolationist power. They really were not trying to get involved with war in Europe. Problem was, German U-boats, uh, you know, submarines in the Atlantic were causing trouble with, uh, like, you know, American, Canadian, and British shipping. Um, so, you know, it was kind of hard to distinguish what, you know, the Americans were still trading with England, so that meant they were possibly under threat of being torpedoed by these submarines. Franklin Delano Roosevelt saw this threat, tried to gear the country up to see that war was kind of coming. Um, and basically, in 1940 and 41, the war was remaining over in Europe. Um, I shouldn't say that because in 19, late 1930s, 1937, the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, Japanese forces are in China. There's full-scale war going on there. Horrible things going on over there. Horrible battles. But in 1941, the United States, until December 7th, was out of it. On December 7th, Pearl Harbor happened. The United States was attacked by Japanese aircraft operating off of aircraft carriers. And essentially, the U.S. was caught off guard. June 22nd, so a few months earlier, the Germans decided to rip up that pact with Russia and invade on uh, June 22nd, 1941. It's hard to ever fully explain how horrible the battles, the atrocities, the things going on in the Eastern Front really were. Um, I'm hopefully getting this figure right. Um, Certainly not to downplay American casualties in World War II, but for every American that died, there were 27 Soviets that died. Um, just horrible experience for the Germans and the Russians. Eventually, the German, uh, the, I shouldn't say the Germans, the Russians turned things over at the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942-1943, started coming west, and eventually the land war in Europe ended. And about this time, May 8th, 1945, um, you know, American and British, Canadian, and some French forces came back over on D-Day, of course, June 1944. But there was also a sustained American air campaign, and the British were doing it as well for strategic bombardment of German targets. Um, there's a lot to be said about that on its own. But basically, after 1941, the U.S. mobilized the war effort. Everybody was into it. You know, they're producing weaponry, they're producing boots, they're producing cans of spam for countries overseas to help fight the Germans or the Japanese. So basically, you know, even though the United States and the Soviets did not really see eye to eye politically, the Americans were still uh, supplying them uh, with weapons, aircraft, um, a great number of things. Um, in fact, going through Montana, that was one of the lend lease routes that the best way to go was over, you know, through Alaska into Western Russia to supply them. So, uh, there's a lot that happens between here and here. This is August 9th, 1945, Nagasaki, um, you know, the Hiroshima, uh, this was specifically the mushroom cloud over Nagasaki, but, um, you know, that's basically the climax of the war. 
the United States focuses a lot of its manufacturing efforts uh, to support, you know, traditional warfare, but the Manhattan Project was ongoing. It was a secret project during World War II, and it culminated in the atomic bombs, um, which basically shaped the way things were going to go forward thereon. 1945, brief moment of world history where peace was kind of at hand. Germany had fallen. Uh, the Japanese had surrendered. Um, so we really hoped things would be a little more peaceful. Unfortunately, they really weren't. The major powers did not fight after 1945, but there was a great number of other things that were going on, um, including, you know, basically England and France, they had suffered immensely during World War II. They had a lot of overseas colonies before World War II. Suddenly they could not supply them, and then all of a sudden there's a lot of civil wars, there's a lot of independence movements going on um, that result, some of them resulted in civil wars uh, throughout uh, the rest of the world. But back in Europe right now, 1945, Germany's carved up. They have occupation zones. The Soviets have Eastern Germany, eventually becomes East Germany. England has the Northwest, the Americans have the Southeast, and there's some French uh, you know, occupation zones in Germany. So they're right there next to each other. And throughout Europe, they basically this guy named uh, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England, um, he was the former Prime Minister at this time in 1946, down in Fulton, Missouri said, there's an iron curtain falling upon this uh, continent. So you have the Soviet Union with a communistic uh, style of government influencing these satellite countries that they had basically occupied coming into Germany uh, during 1945. So these governments didn't really have much of a choice. Uh, by 1948, Czechoslovakia, now today the Czech Republic and Slovakia, were said, basically told, your, your government's gonna be communist whether you like it or not, you don't have a choice. Western powers, and you know, there's a lot of people in these countries as well, did not like that. By 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was established for some of these nations back here to present a united front against a Soviet threat against Western Europe. But one thing to point out about these four or five years um, after 1945 is that there was so much going on, it really establishes what the Cold War was all about. During the years, the war years, the Manhattan Project, there were spies that influ infiltrated the Manhattan Project. Um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were famously executed uh, for their spy work, but there was also uh, Klaus Fuchs, uh, Harry Greenglass, I believe was another name there, who are passing along atomic bomb secrets to the Soviet Union. So by 1949, September to be exact, the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb way before the Americans thought they could. And all of a sudden the United States, you know, was thinking, this is not good. Um, all of a sudden they have the uh, manpower, they have a lot of uh, military strength, but now they have the atomic bomb and that was kind of the Americans, you know, ace in the hole at that point. So the nuclear arms race soon begins. Um, 1949 as well, uh, Mao Zedong um, takes over mainland China, the communist leader there, um, establishes ties, of course, with the uh, Soviet Union. There is a little bit of split by 1960, but that's a little bit later on. Uh, the nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek was forced onto Taiwan. And uh, soon after, in June of 1950, you're looking at the Korean War. Now, June 25th, 1950, it's hard to explain at the time that a lot of people thought that was the outbreak of World War III. Basically, if the North Koreans were coming over into South Korea, everyone was looking over here, it's like, well, are the Soviets going to make a move? I feel like a TV weather guy. Um, we're going to make a move over into West Germany where other hotspots going to uh, flare up. Didn't really happen that way. Um, there wasn't really much of an expectation in the North Koreans part that, you know, May, uh, the United States is probably not going to want to be involved over here, and they were wrong. So uh, United Nations forces and the United States came over to support South Korea. It went back and forth for many years, uh, eventually ended in a stalemate. But the Korean War is hard to overestimate as far as how it influenced American military spending and that, you know, that threat that was um, basically emerging in that Cold War period. So, Russians have the atomic bomb, the Americans have the atomic bomb. American scientists say, we can build something bigger. President Truman at the time says, do we really have to? They said, if we don't, they will. 
Truman says okay. Uh, there was a lot of scientists at the time um, who were really against what was called the super bomb, the hydrogen bomb, much more powerful uh, than that um, atomic bomb. It, it's some reason, in some ways, it's very incomparable. Um, but by 1950, um, there's a lot of research going on, and by November 1st, 1952, the United States detonates the first thermonuclear device. Um, the Soviets follow up soon thereafter. The, the Soviets were definitely doing it on their own as well. But this graph is really just kind of representative of how things really started to escalate in the 1950s. The United States started stockpiling nuclear weapons. By 1960, you can see the United States had a clear lead over the Soviet Union. And by about 1967, the United States uh, peaked out around 30,000 uh, nuclear warheads. The Russians kept going a little bit further at that point, and thankfully things have kind of calmed down a little bit, but this is still representative of a lot of firepower. Excuse me. But the 1950s were also showing a great deal of technology. Uh, jet bombers, the B-52, like the kind they still have up there at Minot, um, were coming into play. Uh, short and intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles were being developed by the Soviets and the United States. This is actually the SS-4 Sandal, which played a uh, key role during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'll get to that point. But, um, you know, it's a different time period because in the 1950s, all of a sudden, the United States learned we're not so isolated anymore. Long-range bombers and eventually missiles could reach the United States, and, you know, in the matter of hours, a lot of cities could just be laid to waste. Uh, nuclear weapons, some of these were just so immensely powerful, they're just very horrible to contemplate. But um, there were some campaigns. Uh, civil defense um, was a big one. Yeah, um, Bert the Turtle, Duck and Cover, uh, a lot of people kind of laugh at that today, but at that point in time it was seen as a way to kind of calm people's nerves, um, to say hopefully you can you know, write out a A-bomb attack. There was a lot of different thoughts about like, you know, what was a nuclear attack going to involve? Could we drive out of the city to evacuate? Could we shelter in place? Um, it's just a staple of Cold War history that we had to include in this presentation, of course. So, 1957, we'll skip a few years forward. Um, Russians launched Sputnik. The missile's not super, I shouldn't say, this was a rocket. A missile has a nuclear warhead, or a warhead. It's meant for, uh, as a weapon. A rocket, in technical terms, means it's being used for peaceful purposes. So the R-7 rocket, also known as the SS-6 Sapwood missile, named by NATO, um, propelled this little basketball-sized uh, satellite into space. Russians launched that. They were super proud of that because they beat the United States in the technological field. In the 1950s, the United States was you know, portrayed as um, an advanced society. Uh, they were paving the way in technology, and the Russians came along and basically one-upped us. So uh, we tried to respond a little too quickly. Uh, we had the American Vanguard, and I put ouch in here for a reason. We tried to put our own little satellite, it was about grapefruit-sized, into orbit. If you've ever seen a video of this rocket launching, it is super embarrassing. The thing comes up about two feet, drops to the surface, this part tumbles off, and the thing just blows up. Um, this is not to say the American rocket program continued to be a failure. There was a lot of what-ifs, and there was a lot of what-ifs behind that Iron Curtain in, so in the Soviet Union where, you know, there was a lot of failures that we didn't really know about until after the Cold War. But eventually from this program, you're looking at the Atlas and Titan missiles rocket family. This Atlas is propelling a uh, Gemini uh, excuse me, a Mercury uh, capsule into space. So that space race is also a big part of the Cold War. But you're also seeing, you know, just the further evolution of miss rockets and missiles. These are liquid-fueled. Um, you get to Minuteman, they're solid-fueled. But um, there were some really great triumphs that came out of the Cold War. Um, you look at the Saturn V rocket, you see, you know, people landing on the moon. Um, technology, the internet, uh, things like that. It wasn't all necessarily bad. Um, some of them were built for bad purposes, but there were some really cool things that came out of it as well. So, crisis years, 1960 to 1962. Um, 
58 to 59, there was a lot of, like, discussion over East and West Berlin. You know, there's East Germany, West Germany, but that also meant the capital of Berlin, um, at one point the capital of Germany, when it was uh, solid before, uh, before the end of World War II, um, was carved up into different occupation zones by the major powers. So basically, there was a lot of people in East Berlin looking over, you know, the Brandenburg Gate here, looking over the border, saying, hey, democracy over in West Berlin looks pretty cool. Um, they got a lot of uh, things going on, and they got, like, the best clubs over there. They got all this really cool stuff going on. Let's move over there, because it's kind of a bummer staying here in East Berlin. East Berlin, um, East Germany, the Russians really did not like that. They're losing some of their best talent. Basically, Nikita Khrushchev and I uh, can't remember the guy's name at this time of East, uh, part of East Germany, um, were saying, you know, we got to end this. Um, basically, what they wanted to do was force the Western Allies out of Berlin. Western Allies said, no, we're not leaving. Um, if you try to force us to leave, we're going to hit you hard, uh, possibly with nuclear weapons. But basically, the crisis there kind of stabilized because of the Berlin Wall. That meant... People in the East could no longer freely travel to the West. There was some tension there, and there continued to be tension throughout the Cold War. I mean, Berlin was seen as kind of a Cold War flashpoint. Um, and in 1961, it was kind of seen as a uh, uh, bigger point of the Cold War uh, crises that happened. Totally skipped over that U-2 shootdown. Um, basically, they're over the Soviet Union. These flights weren't super common, but um, this happened on May 1st, 1960. Um, it was shot down by one of the uh, more improved Soviet missiles, so the Americans were kind of caught red-handed as far as spying and seeing what the Russians were up to with their missiles. By the time Kennedy came in the office, there was a big worry of the missile gap. They determined it, there really wasn't one. Um, in fact, by the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had a clear superiority over the Russians in nuclear missiles and bombers. So, speaking of the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 1962, uh, Fidel Castro overthrows uh, Batista in uh, Cuba during, let's say, 1959. Um, declares it eventually as a socialist state. Of course, Khrushchev over there in the Soviet Union is like, what can we do to help you out? And eventually, um, Castro, mm, it's hard to say. He, he kind of said, like, you know, if you want to put nuclear weapons here, I'm not going to, like, object to it. Khrushchev was, you know... We'll put weapons over here because we know that the Americans have a clear missile superiority. They can launch missiles and bombers from their continent, continental bases, um, along with bases in Turkey, Italy, West Germany, England. Um, so that's kind of the thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis is that, you know, well, don't put missiles over here so close to our country. We kind of did the same thing to them. Um, so honestly, Khrushchev was trying to even the score, but he ignored the point that... Um, you know, ever since the Monroe Doctrine, basically European powers tried to stay out of this hemisphere. Kennedy was, they couldn't allow missiles to be stationed in Cuba. So over the 13 days in 1962, um, there was a lot of tension. Um, it was probably one of the bigger points, not only in Cold War history, but possibly human history. Because a war could have erupted and uh, it was going to be uh, kind of a bad time for everybody. Crisis did end on the 27th, and basically from then on out, things started to calm down a little bit. There was a uh, nuclear test ban treaty in 1963. Um, you know, basically before then, both the United States and the Soviet Union were testing nuclear weapons. You know, out here in Nevada, Western Pacific, the Russians were doing it in the Arctic and I want to say Kazakhstan. So they ended that. Things started to look a little better. Mid 1960s, you know. You're transitioning away from direct threats, um, and I shouldn't say just in the mid-1960s. Um, throughout the Cold War, there was stuff going on all over where both powers had major influence. The mid-1960s, you know, the better known is the Vietnam War. Uh, the French were fighting there in 1954 or even before then because it was a colonial power. Uh, Dien Bien Phu, um, the French forces fell to the Viet Minh. And basically, the United States started coming in and taking a little more of a heavier role because the Viet Minh were a communist force and the South Vietnamese were not. So the Americans were kind of pledging by 1964, 1965. Um, there's a lot of, to talk about in 1964, but 
um, a war going on in Vietnam that eventually results in the United States pulling out uh, the South Falls in April 1975. But it's not just Vietnam. There's so much more going on. Southeast Asia alone, you're looking at Malaysia, um, you know, there's uh, stuff going on with, uh, I believe it was the British, um, with colonialism in that era. Africa, South America, you know, in the 1980s you have the, uh, the Contras and Sandinistas, and that's just one of many other civil wars and conflicts that were going on in uh, Central America. In Africa, this is in Angola, uh, Soviet supplied uh, weaponry and advisors for helping uh, a socialist movement there. Six Day War, Middle East, um, you know, even during the Cold War period, it was seen a lot of different, you know, American military equipment being pitted against Soviet military equipment, even though it wasn't necessarily the East versus West type battle. It was the Israelis fighting different Arab nations, depending on the time period, Six Day War, uh, the Yom Kippur War of 1972. But, um, throughout the world it's just it's hard to emphasize how much influence throughout the world this really you know happened not just culture i'm mean, not just the military i should say art culture um movies i'm you know that come from this uh afghanistan before the united states was ever in there after for the world uh, excuse me the war on terror um american um Interests supplied um, the Ameri United States, uh, the CIA, I suppose, supplied the Mujahideen with uh, forces to fight the Soviets, which had invaded in 1979, December 1979. But even in Europe, there was still the worry of the Russians coming over from East Germany, invading Central Europe. Both sides had tactical nuclear weapons, um, heavier nuclear weapons as well. You know, NATO forces, um, England... West Germany, the United States, they tried to prepare as well as they could for a conventional showdown in Western Europe, but they had those nuclear weapons there as well. And again, throughout the remainder of the Cold War, Central Europe was seen as a place that could spark a nuclear conflict. So in the 1980s, uh, some historians point that out as the second Cold War. You saw a U.S. President, uh, Ronald Reagan, very anti-communist. Um, you know, there's... Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, premier of the Soviet Union, he came in after a series of uh, older leaders that fairly quickly died off. Uh, Brezhnev, I want to say Andropov, and Chernyenko. Um, and then this new guy named Grush uh, not Khrushchev, uh, Gorbachev comes in, he wants to kind of reform the Soviet Union as far as like, we're not doing so well. Our economy is stagnating. We need to stop spending so much money on this arms race with the United States. And so basically, by the late 1980s, he's trying to open things up. Reagan is receptive to him um, and vice versa, that um, arms control agreements are soon put into place. I mean, there was some tension in the early 1980s, 1983 especially. You're looking at um, the shoot down of KAL 007 in September 1983. Uh, there's some other conflicts going on in the world, um, but basically both powers are kind of tired of the Cold War, and uh, it was coming to an end by 1989. This is one of the more interesting years in human history, in my, uh, in my opinion. It's, it's just such, it was a joyful time that Eastern Europe uh, and Central Europe was starting to uh, be free of communism. They were embracing democracy, um, you know, throwing off those shackles. Some of these revolutions, you know, Czechoslovakia, Hungary were a little less violent. Uh, Romania, on the other hand, was a little more violent. But um, the revolutions there, and of course in Germany where the Berlin Wall fell was very significant, meaning Cold War is ending. Um, of course, 1989 also represented Tiananmen Square in uh, China, things didn't go as well for the demonstrators there, uh, to put it lightly. So, of course we have to put a plug in for our side here. You know, this site only exists because of the START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, that allowed this site, um, this control center of 15, this missile silo of 150 in eastern North Dakota to remain. Um, in fact, they had Russian inspectors come over to check to make sure nothing worked.
and you know there was museums um i know at least of one museum in the ukraine where american inspectors came over and said well you can't use that again so i guess it's okay for a museum so you know so many years later after the cold war here um you know we're here to tell that story about the cold war our focus is fairly narrow but we had this presentation just to show you that there is so much more about cold war history than you might have ever learned in school or you might learn in school so um from the oscar zero state historic site my name is rob again um hopefully we had some fun today and uh, we'll talk to you next time